Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to First Baptist Church. Uh, in, in honor of it being a casual service this morning, we're starting a few minutes late. <laughs> Sorry, I was over there having a conversation and they were like, hey Ben, the worship's supposed to be starting. Okay. So, uh, welcome to our first ever outdoor uh, worship service. Uh, without snow. Without snow. Yeah, without right. snow. If you were here Christmas Eve, we got through. But, so we decided not to do it on Christmas Eve. Uh, but thank you for coming today. It's going to be a casual worship service, uh, and the picnic is already started. <laughs> so what we're going to do is, uh, as soon as the worship service is over, you can relax or go use the restroom or whatever and come back to your seats, and, and we will be... Uh, we'll have folks bringing food to you, so uh, enjoy. We've got lots of stuff to play. Um, try to keep the play down a little bit while he's preaching, just for respect. But uh, but it is kind of a casual worship service, and we meant for it to be uh, different. We wanted to try something different and uh, and get folks together. And we're so glad that you came out today. Um, let's yeah. And uh, if you if you could, we would love it if you could move up front a little bit because we've got big gaps up here. If not, if you're comfortable in the back row, you could be in the back row. If, I know you're back. Thank you for that. All right. Now, if you have a worship bulletin, you'll look in it and you'll see the call to worship right there. And I will read the light print, and you read with me the dark print. Upon the gathering of your people, pour out your spirit, O Lord. Be near to us and speak to us, and we will proclaim your glory. Let us pray. Father, it is impossible to be out here this morning and not proclaim your glory, not to recognize you as our creator, our sustainer, uh, our provider for everything that we need. God, for all that you do, for all that you are, we praise you and we worship you. And we pray, God, that our time together this morning will not just be out of obligation, but will be out of true love for who you are and because you loved us first. Thank you for teaching us about all of these things and for continuing to guide us and to love us and to share your love with us and through us to others. Thank you also, Lord, for teaching us and teaching your disciples about our prayer, this prayer that we're going to pray together this morning, going, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. If you're able and willing and would like to, I'm going to invite you to stand as our young ladies come forward to help us uh, to sing Shout to the Lord. And I pray that we'll just uh, hope that we'll sing it loud enough for everyone in the neighborhood to hear.
lectionary reading today is the 124th Psalm. If the Lord had not been on our side, let Israel say, If the Lord had not been on our side when men attacked us, when their anger flared against us, they would have swallowed us alive. The flood would have engulfed us. The torrent would have swept over us. The raging waters would have swept us away. Praise be to the Lord, who has not let us be torn by their teeth. We have escaped like a bird out of the fowler's snare. The snare has been broken, and we have escaped. Our help is in the name of the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Let us pray. Loving and gracious God, we know that you are with us. You have not only been our help in ages past, but you are our help in the present. You will be our help in the future. We come to you, Lord, because we need your help now. We see sickness and death all around us. We see anger, division, and fear. Our problems seem so big and we feel so small. But we know, Lord, that you are able. We know that nothing is too big for you, so we ask for your guidance. Lead us forward through this time of present difficulty. Guide us down the path you would have us follow. And give us the strength and the courage to remain steadfast in our devotion and in our following of you. For it is in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Let us stand and sing our offertory hymn together, please, uh, as our ushers come forward to receive our morning offering.
All right, I'd like to invite the kids. Meet me right over there at the picnic table. You see the picnic table? Right there. There you go. Come on, Sarah Lynn. Right over here. Here we go. Over here. We're going to meet over here at the picnic table. Any other kids want to come join us? Right in here at the picnic table. Isn't this a cool picnic table? All right. Have a seat right here. There you go. All right. I'm going to ask you guys. Let's see. I don't know if you can see over there. Let me see. No, all those people are in our way. Here's what I want you to do. One at a time. Stand up right here. Stand right here. Will you stand right there? Stand up. Here you go. Stand up. I'm going to pick you up and I'm going to want you to look over there and I'm going to tell you, I want you to tell me what you see way over there. Okay. You looking over there? You see way over there? That's right. It's a bouncy house. Look past the bouncy house. You see something else? You see something else? What is it? A slide in the bouncy house. You're exactly the right. And a bouncy house and a here. Can I pick you up and let you look and see if you see anything over there? Okay, I'm gonna pick you up. You ready? Here we go. I see a basketball goal. A basketball goal. <laughs> exactly right. And a door. Somebody left that door open. All right. Can I we... pick you up and see if you what you see over there? All right. Here we go. You see anything over there? A bounce house? Yeah. yeah. Tell me what it is. A Christmas tree. A Christmas tree. You see that? <laughs> Good job. All right. Now that Christmas tree over there is a little bit early because it's not Christmas yet. But if you're like me, you're hoping Christmas comes sooner than later. And guess what? Today, we are kicking off our Christmas movie. You remember last year we made a movie? We're gonna make a movie about Christmas this year. It's called All About That Baby. And we're gonna and and at, and sometime during the picnic, I'm gonna holler. I'm gonna have every, all the children go over there, and we're gonna talk about what we're gonna do in that movie. And it's it's gonna be way fun. But we're gonna share with the whole church this movie, so they will know that that baby came on Christmas Day, and that baby's name is Jesus. You guys have listened so well. Let's have a prayer together, okay? Are you ready? And then we'll get back in the sunshine where it's not so cold. God, thank you for this day that we come together and celebrate as a church. Guide and direct us as your body in this world to keep sharing that Jesus is coming. And guide and direct us as we try and prepare our Christmas movie to share with the whole church and whoever will watch and see that that baby is Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You guys have listened so well. Now you can go back to your seats.
testing all of theirs. I was told, Chris, all right, it's all right. You can go ahead and turn yours off. Uh, I don't think they wanted me to sing along, which I don't, I don't blame. Our scripture reading this morning comes from the book of James, chapter 5, verses 13 through 20. Is any one of you in trouble? He should pray. Is anyone happy? Let him sing songs of praise. Is any one of you sick? He should call the elders of the church to pray over him and anoint him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise him up. If he has sinned, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. Elijah was a man just like us. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. Again he prayed, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its crops. My brothers and sisters, if one of you should wander from the truth, and someone should bring him back, remember this. Whoever turns a sinner from the error of his way will save him from death and cover over a multitude of sins. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing in your sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. If something is solid and dependable, if it's real and tangible, we say that it's concrete. We say it's concrete, and we like concrete things. We like concrete things because they're predictable. That predictability gives us a measure of comfort. And I know that it's an understatement to say this, but nothing feels concrete anymore. Nothing feels concrete right now. Nothing seems solid or dependable. Nearly all of the things that we thought we could depend on now appear to be crumbling before our very eyes. We all knew that the world was changing around us. We knew that. And we knew that we were going to have to make at least some changes to go along with it, whether we liked that or not. But none of us, none of us could have imagined this. None of us could have imagined a worldwide pandemic. We couldn't have predicted that. None of us could have imagined how disruptive it would be, how much it would change things and speed up changes that were already beginning to occur. COVID appears to have put everything into overdrive. And we're all just trying to keep from getting whiplash at the breakneck speed with which seemingly everything is moving around us. We're trying to find our footing, just like everyone else. And I must tell you this morning that everyone is struggling right now. 
Everyone is struggling right now. Everyone is trying to figure things out just like we are. Everyone is trying their best to hold on as best they can. You and I, we are not alone in that. We see the crumbling of things that we thought were concrete all around us, and that has people understandably scared. It has people fearful, not only about the future, but it has people fearful for the present. And we're seeing that fear manifest itself in all sorts of disturbing ways. If you don't believe that, I encourage you to go on YouTube and look up videos of city council meetings and board of education meetings in communities all across this country. It seems as though some people have lost their minds. They're angry to the point that they're no longer reasonable. They're harassing speakers, threatening violence. They're rejecting the truth for conspiracy theories. They're more concerned with feelings than facts. In fact, people are preferring what feels true rather than what is true. And that, in turn, is leading them to behave in dangerous and sometimes even unhinged ways. But we have to remember that anger is often the public face of fear. People are acting angry because people are scared. And this fear, this anger is divisive. It has divided people into differing camps. There's a camp of people who are committed to going back, committed to rebuilding what they believe was, and they believe that they can rebuild it back with stronger concrete. So they view any changes they see as impediments that prevent them from doing just that. They want to rebuild what was, or better yet, they want to rebuild what they imagine the past to have been. Because they want to go back to what makes them comfortable, whether it's true or not. And we have to admit that that's where we are sometimes too. That's where you and I are. We want to go back to perceived comfortability and predictability. We just want things to go back and be normal again. We want things to feel comfortable again. But the hard truth, the painful truth, is we can't go back. I wish we could, but we can't. And those in this other camp have admitted that painful truth to themselves, which is one reason why, one of many reasons why, we see such division. As much as we would like to go backwards, this pandemic, all of these changes that have been forced upon us, they prevented that because they changed us too. We aren't the same people anymore. This experience has changed us, so we can't go backwards. We can only move forwards. And the only way to do that is to go through this mess which we currently find ourselves directly. These divisions are about going backwards or moving forwards, and they have made their way into the church. And I want to be clear here, they've made their way into every church. As some of you know, I had a couple of meetings in Richmond earlier this past week. And over the course of those meetings, I got the opportunity to talk with pastors in churches all over the Commonwealth. Pastors of churches similar to this one. And to be quite honest, we compared notes with one another. We shared what we were seeing at our places of respective service, hoping that we could learn good practices from one another. Is there something different that you're doing in your place that I can bring back to mind? What have you found that works here? Have you found anything? We were bouncing ideas off of one another in the hopes that we would learn from one another and that we could bring something back to apply to our places of service. But what we discovered was that all of us, regardless of the size of our church, we're all seeing the same thing. I told somebody we were all singing from the same hymn. Church attendance has dropped significantly and giving has dropped with it. Every pastor I spoke with told me that their giving is down considerably from last year and that they are behind budget. They told me that they weren't sure what they were going to do next year because of it and that there was this congregational anxiety that was palpable. 
They told me that they just couldn't get people to volunteer to do hardly anything. And then people would get mad that certain programs weren't back yet. You can't have a children's program if you don't have children's volunteers. And people would get upset about that fact, even though they didn't want to volunteer. In fact, they mentioned that people just seemed to be mad about everything. They were mad about life in general. And as I listened to these pastors, many of them friends of mine, I began to feel pretty good about how we weather things here at First Baptist Bristol. Honestly, I was really impressed with how well we've handled things here at First Baptist Bristol. Now make no mistake, times are hard here too. Our attendance is down too. Our giving is down with it. We struggle to get volunteers for some of our missions and ministries, but not all. If you were here this morning, you saw all sorts of folks volunteering and working to get this set up. And I've noticed that some people may have a little bit of a shorter fuse than normal. Some of you may think that I have been less prone to take criticism constructively, and there's probably some truth in that too. I can admit that. I've seen some grumbling here and there. But by and large, we've been pretty united as a congregation. And I'm incredibly thankful for that because that's not going on in a lot of places. I'm thankful that that's the case here. And I think that that is a testimony to our strength as a congregation. It's a testimony to our strength as a church. But we have to be honest with ourselves. Even if we're handling things a little bit better than some of our peers, we still have to figure out a way to rebuild. That doesn't mean we can pat ourselves on the back. We still have to figure out a way to move forward. And that means we're going to have to figure out a way to get through this together, and that is going to take hard work and long days ahead of us. We have to acknowledge all that. We have to be honest with ourselves, but that's okay. It's okay because we still have the Holy Spirit leading us and guiding us. God never promised us that things would be easy. God promised us that God would be with us when we go through hard times. And God is with us now. We also have Scripture to use as a roadmap, a guidepost, so that we can still move forwards because we can't go backwards as much as many of us would like to. But we can still move in the direction God is calling us and leading us to go. And one of the best passages of Scripture for us to use as a guidepost is actually our passage for this morning. James chapter 5, verses 13 through 20. Because you see, James is writing to a group of people who are going through hard times themselves. They're going through hard times. And James encourages them to stick together. Consequently, he gives them concrete steps they can take to move forward. He gives them what we might call a concrete Christianity that details tangible steps they can take together to stay united. And I believe that James is giving us those very same steps, that very same gift today. Beginning in chapter 5, verse 13, James writes, Are any among you suffering? They should pray. Are any of you cheerful? They should sing songs of praise. Are any among you sick? They should call for the elders of the church and have them pray over them, anointing them with oil in the name of the Lord. The prayer of faith will save the sick, and the Lord will raise them up, and anyone who has committed sins will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another, so that you may be healed. The prayer of the righteous is powerful and effective. Reading this, you might think that James was writing to us today. Are there any among you suffering? Yes, absolutely people are suffering right now. Yes. Are any of you cheerful? You, I suppose, I hope so. Are any among you sick? Yes, it seems like everywhere we look, we see sickness and death. Here in these last few verses of James's letter, we see that he finishes it by calling his congregation back to the wisdom of God. We can read it as James calling all of us back to the wisdom of God. 
you see the wisdom from below has caused James's congregation to get into all kinds of trouble, including the divisions that sin and sickness have caused them. That sounds familiar, doesn't it? As Barbara Brown Taylor puts it in characteristic fashion, James does not try to, to explain how this works since their trouble is not in their minds. Their trouble is in the concrete acts of their life together which is why James gives them concrete things to do. Pray for one another. Sing songs of praise. Call for the elders. Anoint with oil. Confess to one another. Bring the wanderers back home. Those remain our concrete steps today. If we want to know how to rebuild when everything around us feels as though it's crumbling, we begin by criticizing less and praying more. We begin by praying for one another. We begin by extending grace to one another. And then we give ourselves the permission to extend grace to ourselves too. Times are hard right now. And the last thing we need to do is to feel sorry for ourselves or for us to start pointing fingers at one another. That's not going to get us anywhere. That's not going to get us where we need to go as a congregation. That's not going to help us rebuild. In fact, that's going to prevent us from rebuilding. So if we want to take these concrete steps to rebuild a crumbling world around us, we have to start with prayer. And then, we have to sing songs of praise. We have to sing especially if we are joyful, but we have to sing even if we aren't. Because in doing so, we are reminded of God's goodness. And we are encouraged and inspired to move forward together. Those who are sick have to call for the elders to pray for them. We have to inform our congregational leaders of what's going on with us because none of us can read one another's minds. If you're struggling, let somebody know. So we can pray for you and be present for you. We can't be there for one another if we aren't honest with one another and tell one another how we're hurt. Anointing with oil was a common practice during New Testament times. It was a cultural practice, and as Taylor notes, whether or not they take oil, the point is for the community to go in search of those at risk of being lost to it. The point is to go to them when they cannot or will not come to you. You see, there is a connection between sickness and sin. Now, I want to be clear here. I'm not saying that illness is proof of wrongdoing. It's not. Illness is no sin, and it is not proof of sin. But sin carries with it guilt. And there are plenty of sick people who are guilty about their illness. Both the sick, both sin and sickness isolate people from one another whether physically or socially, it removes people from community. They both cut people off from one another. And James argues that it is the community's responsibility to meet those people where they are, regardless of whether it's sin or sickness that separated them. It is the community's responsibility to pray for it. In verse 17, we see that James gives this example of Elijah. He writes, Elijah was a human being like us. And he prayed fervently that it might not rain, and for three years and six months, it did not rain on the earth. Then he prayed again, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth yielded its harvest. Now this example of Elijah may seem to be a little out of place. It may even seem to be unnecessary here, but like everything else with James, there's a purpose to it. Gay Byron writes, by using the example of Elijah to exemplify the importance of the prayer of faith, James is not referring to prayer in an abstract sense. Rather, individuals in the entire community are called to offer prayers of faith that can save the sick and redeem the sinner. This prayer of the righteous is powerful and effective. Now, James is not being unrealistic here. Sometimes God answers our prayers, and sometimes God doesn't. God answers the prayers of Elijah, as James points out, but the point is that prayer matters. As we like to say, prayer changes things, whether God answers them or not. The prayer of the righteous are powerful and effective because prayer carries people, regardless of their walk of life, 
through the most difficult of circumstances. Whether God grants our prayers or not, they still help guide us through troubled waters. That's why they're powerful. That's why James calls us to pray fervently and with sincerity. Prayer leads to healing. That healing may or may not be physical, but it is spiritual. And it can most certainly be social. Because prayer draws us not only closer to God, but when we pray for others, it binds us to them in ways both new and beneficial. James concludes his letter by reminding his congregation and us of the importance of bringing back those who have wandered from the fold. Beginning in verse 19, we read, My brothers and sisters, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and is brought back by another, you should know that whoever brings back a sinner from wandering will save the sinner's soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. According to Luke Timothy Johnson, this phrase, cover a multitude of sins, the best interpretation for it is that the one doing the correcting will save another person's soul from death. And that the sins that are covered over or suppressed or prevented are the ones that the associate might have committed if not corrected. Johnson also notes that mutual correction is a form of edification that takes the construction of a community of character seriously. When we commit ourselves to the truth, and when we correct those in love who have wandered or wandered or erred, we are not acting as though we are superior to them. We are not acting as though we are their judge. We are acting in solidarity with them. Because at times, we too are going to need to be brought back to the fold. James is advocating for an intentional community that is structured by the principles of solidarity and mutual cooperation. And these principles, while encouraging us to care for and go after the cut off among us, they also challenge us to engage in self-examination. Are we seeking friendship with God or the world? Are we acting according to heavenly wisdom or earthly wisdom? Do we commit ourselves to envy and competition, to only what makes good business sense, to the survival of the fittest? Or do we commit ourselves to openness and vulnerability, to going after the lost and taking care of the sick, to doing what's right rather than what's profitable, to following spiritual sins? We live in a time, sadly, in which people are voluntarily separating themselves from others. And I'm not talking about people quarantining themselves because they have COVID or because they've been exposed to it. I'm talking about people cutting themselves off from community because they'd rather believe lies that make them feel good than be challenged with the painful truth. They're isolating themselves from others because they want to escape. And that's happening in churches too. Right now, people in churches are putting themselves into one of two boats. There are those who want church to be a form of escapism. That's the first boat. They you want to get away from all this junk, all this garbage they see in the world. They don't want to hear about what's going on in the world. They want church to be a time in which they can escape all of it and leave it behind at least for a few minutes. If you're in that boat, you probably don't like this sermon that much. This one. That's okay. These are people, and there are quite a few people in every church who were in that boat. They want to get away from it all. And I get that. I get why that boat is appealing, but as you've probably already guessed, that's not the boat I'm in. The second boat the boat that I willingly put myself in is the one that views church as a form of empowerment. In that view, we come to church to worship God. That is our primary focus. And in doing so, we are then empowered to go out and be the hands and feet of Christ in the world around us. We are empowered to act like Christ in the world. But if we're going to be the hands and feet of Christ in our community, we have to know what's going on in our community. 
If we're going to be the hands and feet of Christ in the world, we have to pay attention to what's going on around us, and we can't try to escape it. Because we can't escape it. So we have to acknowledge it, and we have to deal with it. We have to be empowered by God to not only survive it, but to do kingdom work in it. And I believe that second boat is biblical. That's why I put myself there. That's how I read and interpret the New Testament. I believe that it's what Jesus calls us to do, even if we'd like to escape things sometimes. Sometimes I want to escape things too. But James reminds us that it's our responsibility to correct and love those who have erred. To tell them the truth and love even when they don't want to believe it because it's painful. It's our responsibility to go after those who are separated from community, whether they've done that through sin, sickness, or self-made decision. It's our responsibility to go after them and bring them back into the fold. That's how we rebuild a world that's divided and crumbling around us. That's how we rebuild our church when doing church is exceedingly hard right now. We commit ourselves to taking the concrete steps that James outlines here. We pray for one another. We sincerely pray for one another. Not just tell somebody, I'm praying for you, but we mean it when we say it. And then we do it. We pray for one another. We sing songs of praise with one another. We find ways to celebrate, which is what we're doing today. It doesn't mean times aren't hard, but we can still celebrate God's goodness. And we do that through song and through fellowship with one another. We call the leaders in our congregation when we're sick and struggling, which means that we trust one another enough to be vulnerable with each other. Whether we bring oil or not, we go to those in need. We confess our sins to one another. And through a commitment to the truth and mutual correction, we bring back those who have wandered away and we bring them back home. Those are our steps. That's our way forward. Because in a world in which it seems like everything else is crumbling, those steps are concrete. And a concrete Christianity is exactly what we need right now. Amen. Let's pray. Loving and gracious God, it's an understatement to say that things are difficult right now. It's an understatement because everything just seems to be overwhelming. And yet we know that you were with us. We know that you were leading us and guiding us if we will simply listen for your voice and have the strength and courage to follow. So Lord, we ask that you embolden us. Move our hearing and move our feet in your direction. And allow us, allow us to follow the concrete steps James has given us. Because those are how we rebuild what's crumbling around us. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Before our benediction, uh, I do think we have a few uh, picnic announcements. Uh, so Trish, do you want to come up here? Or Leroy? Or somebody Trish is coming. come on up. And, Trish is coming. She's on her way. And give us some picnic announcements so we'll know what to do. Here you go, Trish. Oh, no, I don't need a microphone. Can everybody hear me? No, no oh, you okay. might need a microphone. Yeah. Don't stand in front of them. There you go. Hey, everybody. So glad everybody could come this today and spend the afternoon with us. Thank the Lord for beautiful weather. Amen. So the plan is... We've got barbecue, we're going to have bun and barbecue, coleslaw, baked beans, and a bag of chips, and then cookies, three choices. They're on the table over there. But first off, we're going to let everybody get their drinks. So give us just a minute, we're going to get everything in place, 
Then we're going to do sections at a time, let you choose from water, unsweet tea, sweet tea, and Capri Sun over here. Or if you want a Capri Sun, you're more than welcome to be. <laughs> uh, then what we'll do is ask you to sit back down in your chairs or wherever you feel comfortable eating. Got some tables set up or in your chair. Then we're going to have four people serving you your plate. Okay, and then the cookies are on the table over there, so whenever you're ready for your dessert. That sound good? I think that's good. Thank you, Trish. Thank you. All right. And then sometime after that, games will open up, and Ben will invite kids over and families over to talk about the Christmas movie. So enjoy the beautiful weather. Don't be in a hurry. It's good to see everybody and us have some time to fellowship with one another, so let's enjoy that. Amen? Amen. Now, for our benediction. May the road rise to meet you. May the wind be at your back. May the sun shine warm upon your face. May the rain fall soft upon your fields. And until we meet again, may God hold you in the palm of his hand. Amen. Barbecue <laughs> soup.